Okay. All right, so up to this point in the semester, we talked about water as a molecule, how it behaves. Um, now we're starting to transition into talking about water in the ground, groundwater, but before it gets there, it becomes surface water normally. When we looked at the uh, water cycle last week, we looked at precipitation from the atmosphere, rain falls on the ground, various things can happen to that rainfall. It can run off as rivers, it can evaporate or transpire back into the atmosphere, or it can infiltrate first into the unsaturated zone and then to the saturated zone. So this week we're going to talk about kind of that interface between surface water and groundwater and how they relate to one another. So to get there, we're going to start with some basic aquifer definitions so we all have kind of a working vocabulary. We're going to come at aquifers from a number of different standpoints. This first way of thinking about aquifers is one we will talk about a lot this semester. It's whether the aquifer is what we call a water table aquifer or a confined aquifer. So let's say we have a ground surface. What's the water table going to look like beneath the surface? Mimics the earth's surface. Now it might only be down a few feet, might be down hundreds of feet. So I'm drawing this not to any particular scale. And then up here we have the unsaturated zone. And down here we have the saturated zone. The boundary between the two is called the water table. So this is basically what we've been talking about so far. Nothing new here at all, okay? A lot of aquifers don't behave like this though. And a lot of the ones that we will talk about in class don't behave this way. So this next one that we're gonna talk about is one that we're gonna spend a fair bit of time on. And it's called a confined aquifer. Now this one takes a little bit of drawing on my part. Could be scary. Now in this case, we're gonna draw in some geology. So right here, we have a dipping rock unit. Let's see, I might try to highlight this. Let's make it purple. I've had worse drawings, so this right here would be some sort of impermeable layer. Typically a shale. And we call this a confining layer. Doesn't make any sense yet because I haven't drawn in the rest of it. Now let's say we have another shale unit here. Not the right color. 
color. So we have two confining layers. And in the middle, we have our aquifer, which is sandwiched between two of these impermeable layers, okay? Now, this is going to be a slightly more complicated drawing than we're used to, but let's say in this area right here, We can have rain come down from above. We have some sort of precipitation. We get some infiltration. Get some infiltration here. Now in this area right here, I've kind of highlighted in yellow, we might have a water table that looks something like that. Okay, so here's the water table. Okay, sort of mimics the earth's surface. But because of this top confining layer here, this water that's in the aquifer can't rise up. Okay, it's prevented from rising up from that confining layer. And what it's gonna do, it's gonna build pressure. Okay, so from, let's say, maybe this point over, this is what we call a confined aquifer. an aquifer that has a confining layer on top. And that confining layer, you can think of it doing two things. One, it's preventing water from below from rising up. It's also preventing water from above from percolating down. Confined aquifers are great if you're trying to develop water resources. The confining layer acts as a barrier to pollution percolating down. Now, if you pollute this area over here in yellow, then obviously you can pollute your aquifer. But if you put this in orange here, if you do this orange area, the confined aquifer is kind of insulated from damage from any human activities that might be going on up on the surface. So confined aquifers are they're awesome in that respect. Okay, I'm going to go on a little tangent here. So you guys probably know this, that if you have a container that has some water in it, that's at this level right here, if you, I'll draw this a little different now, now, if you have a connected container, where the water can go from one container to the other, how far up in this container here will the water rise? to a point that's equal to the other one. So in this case, it should rise up 
equal with the container on the other side. Okay? That principle, I'm going to erase this now, holds to confined aquifers too. So if we take a area here and we drill into this confined aquifer, this water is under pressure, okay? How far up should the water rise? As high as the highest point in the water table. Perfect answer. So in theory, it should rise up about that high. In practice, it doesn't quite rise that high. It would look maybe something more like, like that. Because some of the pressure is lost as the water sort of fights its way through all of the cracks and nooks and crannies. Point is, though, is that water is going to rise up in this well, and it may even just pour out on the surface. So that's a great thing for water development, too. If it comes all the way up to the surface, guess what you don't have to do? You don't have to pump it. Okay, so this diagram is a little messy, but a couple of uh, terms that go along with this that you may have heard before. I'm going to just go on to the next slide here. You may have heard of, sorry, wrong color there, something called an artesian aquifer. This is any aquifer. where water will rise above a confining layer due to water pressure in the aquifer. Let's say we have something like this. Drill down more surface. Let me just put my tree just to denote the surface. And then let's say we have a Confining layer right here. So here's our confining layer. I'll just call it CL. Okay. And if the water rises anywhere above that confining layer, say to right there, that's what's called an artesian aquifer. Now it can rise higher, can rise all the way up to the surface. If it does rise all the way to the surface, then we have something that's called a flowing well. Another way to think of this is this is an artesian aquifer. Where water flows to the earth surface. So in that case, water would continue to rise up in the well and it would spill out onto the ground if you didn't capture it in some way. 
I know of a lake up in South Dakota where they weren't expecting to hit a flowing well when they drilled, but they hit a very strong flowing well and they couldn't contain it and ended up forming a lake. So these systems can be large, they can be powerful. Now sometimes you can have sort of stacked aquifers. You can have down here, this can be a confined aquifer down here. And on top, you may actually have a water table aquifer. Now, why would you drill all the way through a water table aquifer to get to a confined aquifer? since drilling is expensive. Can you think of any reasons? Water. You don't have to pump it. Or, and also, this water down in the confined aquifer is likely to be cleaner. If you have an area that's full of agriculture, cows crapping everywhere, that water table aquifer may not have the best water quality might be full of E. coli, stuff like this, but this confining layer can sort of insulate the lower water sometimes from those surface activities, okay? So we have water table aquifers. That's typically what I've drawn up to this point in this class, and if you had me for physical geology or environmental geology, that's how I always drew groundwater. But we're gonna spend a lot of time talking about these confined aquifers, because they're really common. The reason they're really common is that there are lots of shale layers, especially on continents. It's the most common rock type we have on our continents. So there's lots of shale, lots of confining layers, so we have lots of confined aquifers. Okay, any questions? Yes, sir? So if, if a tremendous amount of pressure is being like, exerted onto this confined aquifer, but the unit is still hitting onto the surface, why does that pressure going out it's sort of like a spring. Um, let's see. Let me go back here. Um, so if we have, are you referring sort of to that diagram I had earlier? Yeah. Okay, so if I have, where's my car? So if we have something like this, I'm not going to draw this very well, similar to the last one. So in this area right here, right? This weight of water is what's creating the pressure down here. As you get closer, now we talked about this uh, one of the first classes, hydrostatic pressure, right? Hydrostatic pressure is equal to the density of water times the depth of the column times gravity. Well, this depth from here to, let's say, here, that's going to have a certain amount of pressure, right? And as you go up towards the surface, what's going to happen to the pressure? It's going to be less and less because the column is less and less thick. By the time you get up here, you're not going to have any excess pressure there at all. So this pressure here is created by all of this water here pushing down. And physics says that if you push down, it's going to be pushing back up. And if you put an opening in here, that water pushing up is going to rise back up. Does that make sense? Uh, yeah, I can get that. Okay, a little sloppy, but I think you get the point. Okay, a couple other terms that we have here. We talked about these a little last week. I want to go into it a little more depth. Um, we're going to spend the rest of the class sort of talking about this system where we have alluvial aquifers. Again, what's an alluvial aquifer? Something we talked about last week? Alluvial, alluvium. You guys have heard the term, right? Alluvial fans. Alluvium is what? Unconsolidated sediment. Unconsolidated sediment along or created by 
rivers, streams, yeah. So these are aquifers that consist of stream valley fill. Sediment. All right, so let me draw So this material right here is what we call alluvium. It's just the sediment that rolls down from the valley floor and, or from the valley walls and then gets reworked by the stream itself. Okay, so we have our stream valley and we're gonna put a stream in it, okay? Okay, there's a stream. Now there's gonna be an interaction between the stream and the alluvium. In fact, what'll happen is water from the stream will soak into the alluvium under certain conditions. And at other times, water from the alluvium will soak back into the stream. Now this alluvium, just to think about it from a geologic standpoint, this stuff is poorly sorted, generally, especially in mountainous areas. If you're more out in the flatlands, it'll be much more well sorted. So I'll qualify, poorly sorted in mountainous areas, which is kind of the way I drew the stream valley. Okay, we're going to talk about a term coming up here. I'm just going to mention it now. So the interaction between the stream and the groundwater in the alluvium can be responsible for a process called base flow. Something we're going to come back to here in a little bit. Base flow is, and I'll give you this definition here in a little bit so you don't have to write it down now, but it's the contribution by groundwater to the stream. So if you have a stream that's flowing along, some of that stream water may be due to runoff, but some of it may be due to groundwater from these alluvial aquifers leaking into the stream beds. You know, if you go all summer and there's no rain, but your stream is still flowing, that's probably base flow. That's water that was stored up in these alluvial aquifers that's draining into the stream. Okay, so let's look at a couple kinds of 
alluvial aquifers. Okay, so I'm going to just draw the bottom part of the valley here. So let's say your stream level is right here. That's how high up your stream is in your stream bed. If the water table in the alluvial aquifer is higher, something like this, well, that's kind of a bad drawing right there. Let me get rid of that. What will happen is groundwater can flow into the stream. So that's the water table. This is your saturated alluvial aquifer. And this is what we call a gaining stream. So your stream is gaining water. from the alluvial aquifer. Because the water table lies above the stream level. And that's what we would call base flow conditions. Most of the water is coming from the alluvial aquifer. Okay? So you can think of these being in mountain areas, summer, fall, winter. Typical times of the year where in mountainous areas, alluvial systems are gaining streams. Okay, our second example of a losing aquifer is called a losing stream. This tends to happen during the spring, during heavy runoff. When the discharge of the rivers are high and the water levels in the stream are high. Okay, so Think about this kind of from a year standpoint, okay? So, kind of after the spring runoff, let's say middle of the summer, right? We're not gonna get much precipitation. Actually, probably till spring. We'll get a couple of storms here and there. We'll get some storms in the winter, but it's snow, right? So it's gonna sit on the land. So what happens is stream levels drop, right? And as stream levels drop, more and more water pours in from the groundwater system. 
What happens to the water table level of those alluvial aquifers during that time? They're going to decline, rise, or stay the same. If they're losing water to the stream, they should drop, right? So by the time spring comes along, your water level in your stream is super low. The water level in your aquifer, the water table, is really low. And then all of a sudden spring comes. Sun comes down, starts melting all that snow. What happens to the stream level? Rises really sudden, right? Well, in that case, let's say we have a stream that's filling up its channel. It may even be flooding, okay? Where's the water table at this point? Remember, this is after the winter takes place. It's way down, right? So here's your water table. Water table is way down here. And here's your water table. And what'll happen is water from the stream will then start pouring into this unsaturated zone. What's going to happen to the level of the water table then as this high spring flow occurs? Well, as water is leaking out of the stream into the alluvial aquifer, you're going to see that water table level start to rise. So a losing stream is where you have stream flow that's going to be lost to groundwater, which typically happens during the spring. Okay, any questions on this conceptually? Remember, stream levels can change very abruptly right? You get a big storm, a bunch of runoff, stream levels go up really quick. In flash flood conditions, they can change over a period of minutes. Groundwater always sort of lags behind. It takes a, water for that wa a while for that water to percolate into all those pore spaces, okay? So it takes a while for the water table to always catch up to these changing things. In the spring, water table's low, stream level rises really fast, water starts percolating in, that water table is going to gradually rise. And it'll rise to the level of the river. But then what starts happening near the end of the spring runoff? Once you don't have that component of, say, snow melt, the stream level starts to drop, right? And it can drop pretty fast. But now you have a water table that's really high. So water can start pouring in slowly and keep feeding the stream, even if there's no more precipitation. So as the summer goes on, fall goes on, winter goes on, that stream level might slowly, slowly, slowly drop. Might be little spikes every time there's a rainstorm, but overall it keeps lowering, lowering, lowering. And the water table keeps lowering, lowering, lowering. It keeps following that stream level. Okay, everybody follow that? So what we're gonna do now is look at this from a more quantitative standpoint. We're gonna look at the mathematics of this, okay? Yes? Does this also occur with like lakes and other bodies of water? It can, yeah. Yep. Definitely, if you have the shore of a lake, that water is going to seep into the shoreline and the rocks and soils around it. Lake levels, because they typically have such a big volume, change a little more slowly than rivers do. Um, but yeah, same process. Yeah, if you go to a place like Wisconsin, Minnesota, all those lakes, those lakes sit at the level of the water table, okay? So they'll come up a little in the spring, they'll go down a little in the fall. They don't vary all that much because it's a fairly wet environment. A lot of the lakes around here, um, you see all these, and there are very few natural lakes in this part of Colorado. Just about every lake you see is a gravel pit that's been filled up with water. 
and those are all manipulated. They're usually, uh, water is uh, pumped into them in the spring to store it, and then it's slowly let out during the year into the streams for farmers, ranchers, people with water rights downstream. So they're used kind of as storage units. Take water out in the spring when it's really flowing, release it during the year when you need it. Okay, so we're gonna look now at the mathematical relationships between streams and groundwater. All right, a couple of terms. We're gonna look at something called a hydrograph. Anybody in here dealt with hydrographs before? Yeah, hydrology. Hydrology, it's exactly where you would deal with it. Maybe a little in my environmental geology course. Is basically a plot of river discharge over time. We usually use Q for discharge. It's a volume over time unit, something like cubic feet per second, as an example. These plots are constructed at a particular point along a river. Other common units that you might see might be cubic meters per second. Occasionally you'll see gallons per minute. The one you're most likely to see is cubic feet per second. All right, let me draw a hydrograph for you. A typical, it's kind of a typical hydrograph for a mountain stream, something like the Poudre River, Big Thompson River, something coming out of the mountains down onto the prairie. Okay, so a hydrograph again is a plot of discharge, Q, And in this case, let's make it just cubic feet per second, even though I'm not going to put any units with it. And down here, we're going to have time. And we're going to span a year. So let's start in January. Go through the end of December. Okay, so the snow melt in the mountains usually occur around here. It's a late spring, early summer thing, right? So we're usually talking May or June. Sometimes you get a little bit of it in April, you, know, you can get some nice warm days in April, but right now we're in February, right? I don't know if you've looked at the river levels around here, but man, they are low, low, low. You see rocks sticking out, water just barely moving in there. 
And until the snow melts, there's not going to be any runoff to feed the stream, right? So those levels are just going to keep dropping. What little water is in the stream is base flow from somewhere up farther upstream leaking out of those alluvial aquifers. So it's going to happen for a couple of months. So let's put May right here. And then let's put July right here. Might be a little messy. So what will happen is we're going to steadily drop our discharge until sometime in middle April, May, and then we're going to start getting some snow melt. What's going to happen to the amount of water in the stream? It's going to start rising, right? And at some point, say in mid-June, it sort of peaks, right? And then once that snow melt all ends up in the river and gets carried away, you're not going to get a whole lot of input from precipitation events. We're going to get an occasional storm, but in here the summers are really dry. We get a handful of storms, we don't get a lot of rain, and what's going to happen is the water's going to start to lower, okay? And it's going to look something like this, where it just sort of decays down and looks like that, and then continues on on this side. So let's say from maybe here where it starts going up to here, these are the conditions, what would that be, a gaining stream or a losing stream? Okay, so the, this is where we're starting to get runoff, right? What's happening to the stream level? Getting higher, right? Remember the water table always lags behind the stream level. So down in this area here, water table's really low along the edges of the stream. Now the stream rises really fast from that runoff, right? So the stream level's gonna go up quick, and some of that water's gonna bleed into the alluvial aquifer, right? Water's gonna be lost from the stream, right? And that's called a losing stream, okay? So we have losing stream here. The alluvial aquifer is going up. So stream level goes up, water table follows it, follows it, follows it. Then once that pulse of snow melt is gone, what happens to the stream level then? It starts to drop, right? But the water table now is high because it's been replenished during these losing stream conditions early in the year. So now from this point here, all the way to this point here, this is where you'll have a gaining stream. We also call these base flow conditions. All right, I'm going to redraw this, all right? Starting the year around the end of June when this hydrograph peaks, okay? So let's redraw this. Q versus time. June, let's see, let's make this July 1st. Make this June. I'm gonna put April right about here where conditions start. So what's going to happen is water's going to go down till April. Get little bumps along the way. You might get a little rainstorm that comes in. Okay, and then 
starting around April, we start to get the snow melt, right? So then back up. This part of the year going from here to here, where the water level in the stream is gradually dropping, water's coming out of the alluvial aquifer, this section through here is something called a base flow recession. what's happening during this time is stream levels are dropping. And the water table also drops. Okay. So what we can do and what we can learn a lot from is the mathematics of this process. So you can see our base flow recession isn't a nice linear drop, right? Drops off a little steeper at first. You can see it's kind of a curve, right? If I drew a best fit curve, it might look something, let me get a thicker line here, might look something like, I kind of missed it there, but you get the point, right? kind of a curve shape. Well, we can actually put some math to this and figure out some pretty interesting stuff using something called the base flow recession equation. I'm going to write this out. I'm just going to write it all out and then we'll talk about it, okay? Okay, let's define the terms. This is useful um, because this equation can tell you what the expected discharges in a stream would be at any point in the year. Okay, so if you wanna know what's going to be the stream flow on August 3rd, if you're a water manager, let's say this stream is draining into a reservoir, okay? Think about, how many of you have been up to Estes Park? Probably most of you, right? You've seen Estes Lake, right? Estes Lake is dammed up river, okay? Water managers try to keep this at a certain level. You don't want it too high, because if it's too high and you get a lot of rain upstream, it can overfill your dam, right? If it gets too low, then you're maybe not managing the water downstream well enough for people. A lot of the reason for putting dams is to store water for later use. If you're letting too much water go, you're just letting it flow downstream and people can't use it. So you really want to be able to know how much stream flow is going to be coming into my dam at all times. Okay, That's a really useful thing to know if you're a dam manager. You want to know what's the expected amount of water that's going to come in two months from now so that I can decide if I should let water go or keep water in. They're always managing water flows, okay? This equation allows you to do that. So our first cue right here is discharge. Anytime
after the start of a base flow recession. Typically, late spring, maybe early summer. In this case, we're looking at it at July 1st, okay, for this particular stream. Each stream has its peak flow at slightly different times, depending on how big the watershed is, how much snowpack, what the elevation is, the climate is. Here in Colorado, some around, sometime around July 1st. You go down to New Mexico, it's several weeks earlier. You go to Alberta, it's several weeks later. So a lot of things going into it, but this is specific for each watershed. Q with the knot at the bottom, Q naught is the discharge at the start of the recession. This is typically your peak discharge for the year, okay? The highest your water level is, and then it's going to tail off afterwards. This term right here, e to the negative kt, have you guys seen anything like that before? Any other classes? You may have seen it in a math class, obviously. You may have seen it in a physics class. It's really common in geology, okay? This is, you can either think of it as a growth function or a decay function. Basically describes how an exponential line either grows or how it tails off. In this case, it's tailing off, right? The amount of water is less over time, it's decaying. And the thing that tells you whether it's a growth function or a decay function is that right there. Oops, it went away. See that negative KT? That negative sign right there tells you that, in this case, it's a decay function. If that was a positive, it would be a growth function. You guys have all seen exponential growth, right? We're doing that with COVID half the time, right? Seeing things spike up. That's a positive K when it spikes up. When it decays, and that's kind of what we're in now with COVID after the holidays, we're now looking at a decay function where the numbers are dropping exponentially. That's a negative K. T is time. And that K is something that we call a recession constant. I'll probably rewrite this on the next page since it's getting kind of messy. And that recession constant Stint is unique to each watershed. Okay, let me rewrite this on the next page. And I'm going to uh, put my hydrograph a little different. I'm going to put real numbers with it so we can go from there. So let's make a decent hydrograph. I'll try to draw this properly. Q in cubic feet per second. Going from 0 to 500. This is January, February, March, April, May, June, July, August, September, October, November, December. And then there's the end of December right there. Let me redo that.
this particular watershed starts to get some runoff right at the first of the year, okay? And it's going to peak in May. So let's go... And then it's going to decay like that, okay? Now, from May, one month June, one month July, one month August. We're going to look at these three months right here, okay? So this is three months. We'll just approximate it 90 days, okay? And here's the kinds of questions that you can answer with this base flow recession equation. So remember, here's the base flow recession equation. Q is Q naught e to the negative kt. So here's a question that you could address with this type of equation. What is the discharge? What is the Q? On August 1st, if the stream reaches a peak flow of 500 cubic feet per second on May 1st. Okay, in this case, it's pretty straightforward. We want to solve for Q. We want to know what the Q is, right? What is our initial discharge at the start of the recession? 500 cubic feet per second. K, we're going to talk more about K, but K is unique to each watershed. And the next example I'm going to show you is how you actually figure out what K is for a watershed. I'm just going to give you a K to use right now, okay? K for this watershed is 5 times 10 to the minus 3rd and the unit is one over day. You'll see why in a second. Time is the length of time since the start of the recession. If it starts on May 1st, June 1st is a month, 30 days, July 1st, another month, 30 more days, August 1st, another month, 30 more days, total of about 90 days. Yes? One over day, okay. or day to the minus one. Okay, so look again at this little part of the equation right up here, kT. What's the unit for k? One over day. What's the unit for t? Day, if you multiply K by T, what's your unit? No unit, right? Days cancel out, okay? So there's no unit up here. So then E is just raised to a number, no unit. So it's not going to have a unit. Q equals Q. They both have the same units. That's what you want. So the whole point here is to get the units in the exponent to cancel out, okay? 
It's pretty simple. So you just have to make sure. Now I can screw with you and give you K in one over days, and I can give you T in months. Okay? I could just say three months. You gotta have the same units. So you gotta convert months to days. Just make sure you have the same time unit in K and T. Okay? Go ahead and calculate it. See what you get. Okay, the first thing you ask yourself, should your answer be more or less than the initial discharge? It's a, di it's a decay function, it should be less, right? So if you have a number greater than 500, something's not right. Most likely you didn't put the negative in the K, okay? So I got 318, is that what you guys got? Anybody didn't get it? Okay, um, let's... Let's do one more after a break.